So hi everyone and welcome. Welcome to this uh, conversation interrogating media is reporting on uh, the, vi the variations of sexual violence that women express. I am Jackie Kemugisa and I'll be a moderator. Now before I introduce my amazing panelists, I just want to thank the organizers uh, Akina Hivos for putting together this conversation. On that note, let's do some housekeeping. This conversation can be um, triggering. So if you need to step away from the computer, please do so. Um, second, given our unpredictable internet, uh, the, if your screen is choppy, please refresh. And if you're running out of data and have the privilege of buying more data, please do so. We will slot in a Q&A uh, so you can post your questions on the feed or you can use the hashtag media and me too on Twitter and we'll pick the questions from there. Thirdly, this conversation is about an hour-ish long, so grab a beverage of your choice. I will be taking some tea. And if you suddenly hear the dog barking, blame my neighbor. So that concludes, <laughs> that concludes our housekeeping. And it's my pleasure to introduce our amazing panel. Joining us is Lydia Namubiru, a data journalist, researcher, and editor. Kiki Modi, an award-winning invest investigative journalist. Alice McCool, an, indep an independent journalist and producer. And before we dive into the conversation, the history junkie in me would love to just provide context for our conversation. So um, many black feminists have talked about the politics of citation, especially when it comes to uh, black women's labor. So in the spirit of citation and crediting, I'd love to remind us that the Me Too movement and hashtag start, was started by a black American activist, Tarana Buck in 2006. She created the hashtag to allow women to share their experiences. And 10 years later, the, the hashtag and the movement has exploded with the allegations of the now convicted uh, Harvey Weinstein. And, sorry. So with that, um, I think that that's where our conversation now uh, comes in. And today's conversation isn't just important, but it is also uh, an invitation to think and learn with us about the best practices. So I will start by asking our panelists to share an image or a video um, illustrating our topic. And we will start with Alice, then Lydia, then Kiki, in that order. You will each take five minutes. And I'm trusting that we are journalists will stick to uh, the time, given that we know and understand uh, the rule of uh, word limit. So Alice, you have the virtual floor. Thank you so much, Jackie, uh, for your introduction. Um, so, sorry, one minute. Technical issue. Um, yeah, so I chose, um, there's three illustrations. So if you go back to the first one, and then the second and the third, just to uh, give everyone a sense of the three images. Um, so these are illustrations by Charity Atukunda, an illustrator in Kampala, who I've collaborated with on a few stories now. Um, Charity did these illustrations to accompany a CNN investigation I did into the case of Bernard Glaser, which some of you may be familiar with, others not, um, but he was a German national who was um, in prison in Uganda, um, accused of abusing girls in his care. Um, so for over 10 years, he ran an unregistered children's home in Kalangala um, for girls who had already experienced abuse. Um, so, I'll talk about the images in a minute, but just to say this um, investigation was a real um, learning experience for me, particularly in terms of when we're talking about media narratives. Um, so to me, you know, the evidence was quite damning uh, against Glaser. Um, I mean, initially, of course, there's why would these women and young girls lie? There were so many of them uh, who were coming out, had survivor testimonies, testimonies from journalists who'd investigated the case 10 years ago. Um, 
testimonies from volunteers who'd, who'd been at the place, testimonies from police saying he had bribed officials not to investigate him. Um, even recently, a government prosecutor told me they found a photo and vid video evidence of girls as young as five um, on his laptop. Um, and, you know, I spoke to a, um, actually a podcaster in New York about the topic um, with the possibility of doing a radio piece. But for him, he was saying, well, it's not that interesting from a podcast perspective because it's obvious this person is guilty um, and we want it to be more something which is a bit more blurred or a bit more unclear, he guilty or not. Um, and yet this was the conversation that was happening in Uganda. Um, and with the media often ultimately defending Glaser as a kind of white savior for these girls. Um, and when I was approached to do this webinar, um, the concept note also made this point, um, saying that these kind of articles were the ones that got traction rather than mine. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting to explore as we go through this discussion, um, as what the reasons behind this might have been. Um, anyway, on to the images, pretty quickly. Um, so Charity had a um, real challenge of visualizing this harrowing story. Um, and I think she really rose to that challenge and actually her images were a big factor in why the article um, did quite, quite well online. Um, so she sent me through um, an explanation of what she did, uh, what she did here, which I'll just briefly read to you guys and I'm done. Um, so she said, um, when creating illustrations, I really like to immerse myself into the subject and research. The research process always informs my images. Physically meeting the young girls and sitting in on the interviews allowed me to have a clear and more intimate understanding of their perspective. The points in common in each of their stories was a recognition of the power dynamics at play. Seen in the first image with the girls holding up a sign and Glacier seated, statuesque. Uh, the second image representing sexual abuse, which I wanted to convey in a less literal sense by focusing on expressing on the emotions of the girls with the man's shadow, as you can see. Um, and lastly, we have the resistance, the third image, which is to portray their actions as able to topple that power structure. So visually, we've got images to show the power, the abuse, and then the breaking down of that power. And yeah, something I'll come to later is, is telling stories of resistance, um, as well as the, the sexual violence itself and, and how uh, important and powerful that can be. That's it. Thank you, uh, Lydia, it's your turn. And just to, for the audience to know that uh, the panelists are turning off uh, their videos, uh, mainly because uh, we understand their data problems. So if that happens, it's not something weird, it's just that we are trying to preserve uh, your data. Uh, Lydia, you have the virtual floor. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, so I have here, but we, before I even talk about, you know, the prevalence of sexual violence in the media, so sexual harassment in media organizations, I want to note that these sorts of things are st hardly studied. Uh, this is not, you know, and employers do not regularly study the extent to which uh, there is sexual harassment in the in in their workplaces, and, and in that in that obscurity, official obscurity, a culture thrives. So this, it's hard to come upon data that tells you how big a problem this is. But when you do, you find, you know, like this is a study from, uh, from women in uh, women in the newspaper, about women in the newspaper industry. And this asked just over a hundred people, women in the news, uh, they asked just of just over just about about 119 people in nine countries across sub-Saharan Africa. This would be women in uh, who are in the news uh, across sub-Saharan Africa and the uh, MENA region, and that's really sample size when you take into account how big a region. This uh, that's a really small sample size when you take into account how big a region those two are, but the the, the findings are not unusual, they're not unbelievable uh, to find that 64% of women have been verbally harassed um, and 29% in Africa have been sexually 
uh, have, have been, sorry, and 24% have been physically harassed, that is people touching them in ways that are sexual at the workplace. And 10% um, 10, 10 have actually suffered sexual assaults. That's, and I mean, we say sexual assaults, but have been raped is more the, the word to use. And so you, when you think about that, if you're in a newsroom or if you're part of a media organization, there's a really good chance that one in every 10 of your colleagues has been raped by one of your colleagues. And that's all the vast majority, most of the women you're sitting with in the room have been verbally harassed. So, um, so there's, I don't want to dwell too much on sort of how much that victimizes women, but I think such like numbers also tell us how much that kind of behavior is quite simply culture. It's normative. When more than half of your colleagues have been verbally harassed by another colleague, that there isn't one bad apple. There isn't some guy who goes around doing it to everyone. That shows lots of people are doing it. Uh, and, and actually, if, you know, like every woman knows, people, this, this is very normative. I, I wouldn't even say it's that it's, you know, in the media, it's higher than it is elsewhere. And, and the trouble, part of the trouble with how we talk about harassment uh, is insisting on, do, on talking about it only in the most extreme forms, right? Like the only, the easiest stories to sell is if an old man was raping children, uh, which is, is terrible, but it also, like when those are the only, uh, or an old man was raping children, or uh, an, an, um, a powerful director raping and then upcoming uh, actors. The problem with that is that it creates, uh, well, of course we should tell those stories, but also we should be pushing to tell the more, the more normalized experiences, the things that, you know, what makes me too viral is the fact that so people go through it and we, we accept it, which is, which is odd because it is illegal. And when media houses are told to deal with it, uh, often you get the sense that people, are, people think this is coming from the political correct left, yeah? But actually people are telling you to deal with, with an illegality in your, organization, in your organization. Very few media houses would continue to employ a person who has been even just tried for fraud, but a blind eye to sexual harassment, even though, you know, there is, in fact, in the case of Uganda, there are labor regulations that name it as an offense that set a penalty that includes, by the way, a prison term for sexual harassment at the workplace. So, so but, but at the same time, the subject of sexual harassment in the media is sort of three-pronged. So that is what journalists go through at the workplace, then there are the sexual harassment experiences of journalists, female journalists. What happens to them when you send them to interview powerful men? Uh, when what happens when what happens to them when they're covering rioter situations? Uh, you know, gro being groped on the street because they're covering rioter situations. What happens? What happens to them? All, all over, all the time when they're doing their work. And that's also something that media houses should concern themselves with. We do risk assessments for assignments. Well, I hope that <laughs> lots of media houses do this. But I mean, it's, it's common practice to do risk ass assessments for, for assignments. For instance, in the case of coronavirus, then you give people one. You even have now, you know, media house branded masks because to continue to work, 
is to continue to be exposed to a, vir a virus that's out there. So, and I think media houses should concern themselves with this sort of thing. What happens when you're, when you're a reporter, when your on-screen talent is being actively harassed uh, on the street? I think it's an incident like that with NBS, an on-screen uh, anchor was being actively harassed by a cut on the street. And the newsroom decided to make a fun story out of that. It also shows you how people do not realize, and even in that case, even the reporter defended it, which I think speaks to how, when, how, how, how unseriously we take this to be. And so I want to remind every, uh, you know, uh, but also I think it happens to you once, you laugh it off, it happens to you another time. Eventually, female reporters get burnt out about that kind of thing happening to them over and over again. Eventually, they may not even realize it. They start to choose different assignments. Um, newsrooms talk a lot about how female reporters tend to stick to desk jobs. But maybe a part is how, you know, the husband they will face when they go out to be field reporters. And newsrooms need to be thinking about how do we protect you? How do we support you? Without limiting what stories you then choose to do. And then the third part to it is um, how we report that. I think how we deal with it internally is very, very important because then it will inform how we see people, victims and perpetuators outside. Uh, one of the most productive conversations I've had about Me Too was with uh, an old friend of mine who is a man. And he came to me and said, you know, the thing that um, once all, I'm sorry about that, someone more. Can I? Can you hear that? Can you still hear uh, me? I can, but there's like an echo. But again, we had, uh, given the fact that we are home in the lockdown, so we, I'm sure the audience can accommodate. So I think, I okay. think it has faded away. Yeah. Right. So I think if we can, if we can, um, sorry, I need to make it stop. Just so give me a minute. Can you go to somebody else? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Okay. Hear you. Okay, uh, Kiki, would you like to join in? I hope there is no one mowing their lawn uh, in your background. So uh, please join. Thank you so much. And we can again share uh, an image or a screenshot to just illustrate the topic and allow the audience to come with us. Kiki, right. you have a virtual flow. Thank you very much. Um, I want to I just, this is the perfect uh, photo to start, this perfect screenshot. Uh, this is a screenshot from the documentary um, that is on YouTube, Sex for Grades. Uh, in this, you can see masks in these screenshots, and it's because we developed a, a pattern for reporting stories of sexual harassment in this particular documentary. All the victims had to wear these masks. Um, while we wanted it, while we wanted to protect the victims, we didn't want them to look like they were coming from a place of cowardice. So we, we created something, you know, urban and very African to connote strength. We were trying to um, tell people that these people are coming from a place of strength. It takes a lot of strength to be able to deal with sexual harassment and then want to come out and say something. So that was why we put out these masks. We went through great lengths. It took us longer than usual. We could have done this story in a couple of months, but it took us over a year because we wanted to transfer the, we wanted to focus the camera on the perpetrator. So if you've seen the documentary, you'd see that um, the film showed the faces of all the perpetrators and not so much the faces of um, victims because they were protected with these masks. And then there is also a screenshot of a comment. I just went there this morning to the YouTube, um, uh, to the YouTube comment section for the first time. And then I saw, oh no, we can go back to that from our image. And then I saw the comment for the first time. Um, thank you for showing the abusers' faces. It's good to see that 
you know, for once the victims are kept in anonymity and the criminals are revealed. And this was the basis of why it took us longer. This is the very basis of why it took us longer. And in reporting sexual harassment, we did a lot of research and the numbers were not looking good. You know, the media ourselves, we seem to, you know, be sort of complicit in how we report cases of sexual harassment. There is a whole media trial um, that victims get to suffer because they dead speak out. And that just reinforced the culture of silence that we've suffered. And if anything, the media should not have a hand in this. So um, I'm just going to talk about, you know, my experience investigating and reporting uh, sex for grades, which is kind of like the, the, the landmark for reporting for me, sexual harassment. Um, we investigated in Nigeria and in Ghana, and while there were similarities, there were also differences in the way that sexual harassment um, is treated in both countries. And it spans beyond those two countries. It's actually the rest of Africa, because ever since the documentary dropped, the conversation has gone you know, worldwide and people are speaking up about how the sexual harassment that they face in their own country. Um, so it's very similar in Africa. We can draw a straight line around all the countries to a culture of silence, shame culture. And I experienced it firsthand on the job. Most of our reporters did. Um, most of our reporters experienced like having to be the ones to having to be the ones to feel ashamed for being touched. Even most of us, you know, the women amongst us had experiences of personal experiences of sexual harassment. While we were training to go undercover, you know, some of the trainings on how not to put yourself in danger, because in investigating things like this, you also put yourself at a risk. And, you know, we had to play out a scenario. And it was a little bit I don't know if I can use the word traumatizing, but it was a little bit heavy for the female investigators the, or journalists that went undercover to replay that moment because many of them could, many of them knew exactly what it meant in real life. And it, was, it wasn't just role playing. In real life, they've been in a situation where a man suddenly started to lock the door. It was very familiar for them. And in that moment, we knew that we had a duty, you know, as survivors ourselves, to actually make sure that when we're telling this story, we don't we don't make people suffer the things that we've suffered before. So how do we not like how do we not um, how do we not report uh, sexual harassment? In so many ways, I mean, it may not be an investigative film. It could be an article. It could be a tweet. In fact, as a matter of fact, it could be a news report on radio or on TV. And um, there are so many things that we do that, there's so many words that we use that sort of, that sort of puts um, the victim on blast, that sort of makes the victim the subject of the story. And if it's a subject of a harassment story, the harasser should be, if, if we're talking about a harassment story, the harasser should be the subject of that story. So in the words that we use, that we say so, 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 and so was raped, we are, we're, we're putting you know, this person in front while we could have easily framed it as, you know, abuser X, you know, abused or raped this person, we have put the, the victim in front. You know, sometimes it's the words that we use. And then, and then the example, I mean, my example, the one that I'm very familiar with is in the way that we report. We could have easily put the victims in front of the camera, the ones who were not afraid of being in front of the camera, put them on, on camera. Until today, we would have been talking about how um, this victim one time went for a party when she was 16. That means she must be a wild person. You know, it could have been, you know, it could have been really hard. We have Monica Osage in Nigeria who came out to tell her story. She had um, audio recording of a lecturer demanding for sex. Until now, she says she finds it difficult to get a job. All right. I mean, even myself, the journalist that put my face to the story, I still get emails. I still get hate emails uh, to this very point of people saying that, I'm ruining the reputation of the continent, you know? And they don't think for one second that maybe these people who have been put in trust to take care of and to teach the young women in universities are the ones ruining the reputation of the con continent by continually sexually harassing the, the girls and women that have been put in their, in their care. And maybe they don't think for a moment that the institutions, the schools, the police, the justice system 
continues to put us in bad light by not properly investigating or by not properly demanding accountability from these people or by not properly giving justice to the people who have come out to report sexual harassment. You know, it's always, it's always going to be back on, you know, the victims to be held account. So I just put down a few notes. I'm, I just put down a few notes of so many things that we do as the media to sort of, to sort of contribute to the culture of victim blaming and the media, it's, it's very important that we, we, we look at this introspection because the media is a very, very important driver of the, the movement. You know, you talked about the Me Too movement um, starting from a black woman and all that. And it was the space. Sometimes it was social media, sometimes it's you know, traditional media. These spaces are drivers and these spaces need to drive us exactly to where we're going to and not in reverse. So sexual harassment um, seems to be the only crime where victims become the accused. Automatically, they're accused of either lying or inciting or you know, provoking or seducing. The list goes on. And the way that we report sexual harassment has put too much on the victim and not enough on the perpetrator. And you know, the media is supposedly unbiased. Somehow we find ourselves tilting to the side of oppressors because we've been silenced, silenced in the face of adversity. I personally am not unbiased when I'm reporting my stories. I'm, I'm biased towards the victim. It, it, it shows. I mean, if I can use that, if I can use that phrase, it, it, it's, I, I would always stand for the victim. I tilt towards, you know, the victims and the story because it's the least that I can do because it's the platform that's going to drive conversations. Where am I steering the conversation towards? Am I steering it towards victim blaming or at least accountability for perpetrators? So it's high time as a continent, first of all, that we transfer the shame that we always feel as survivors or as victims to the perpetrators. Because, I mean, if a person steals they feel, and they're caught, they feel shame. Somehow, if, when it comes to rape, is the victim that starts to feel ashamed and it doesn't make any sense. So I just put down a few things that we can talk to ourselves. And it's not just for journalists because we all have a media space right now. I mean, it's 2020, everybody owns maybe a Twitter account or a Facebook account, and that is your own platform, to be honest. So there are so many things that we can do on our own to help, to make sure that we're not you know, reporting sexual harassment in a bad way. You know, we don't need to re report sexual harassment by stripping the victims of dignity. We, c we do not expose their vulnerabilities to the world. If they want to be anonymous, let's do our best to make sure that they're completely anonymous and not in an undignified way. You know, we don't dehumanize them. Yes, we have figures, millions of girls being harassed, but those be be behind those figures are actual human beings. Um, we don't shame them with our words or with open-ended questions. Like, you know, people, all of a sudden you start talking about her dressing. I mean, we all know where that is headed towards. We don't distract from the stories with irrelevant information. We don't make them a target for bullying. We don't make the, we don't make the victim the focus of the story. And the only time we make the victims or the survivors rather the focus of the story, if it's, if it's a story of surviving, if it's a story of survival, then, of course, by all means, we make them the hero in their own story. But if it's a story of abuse, I mean, we make the abusers the, 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 the subject of the story. So I'm just going to wrap it up here to say that my experience um, investigating um, sex for grades was one of the most humbling experiences for me. A lot of people say, oh, the, 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 the team, you guys are heroes. But truly, everyone who wore that mask, you know, the mask in the screenshot that we saw earlier, are truly heroic to me because I saw myself in them. I saw them break down. I saw them pick themselves up and I saw them decide to take a stand. So it was really, it was really empowering for me. It was really inspiring for me. And the process of investigating I'm just going to wrap up with what the process of investigating for us was. We used a human, a, we were humans. We weren't just journalists. We were human beings investigating this. We looked, we were very thorough as well. I mean, we didn't just want to take all what's on top because we knew that this, 
had a propensity of being a cultural shift for us, where we take the story into our own hands. This could have been our own need to, you know, in our own space here with all the context that we have. And it's even, you know, maybe different for how it's happening in other countries or other continents, because for us here in Africa, we took our stories, zero platform, we took our own stories and we decided to start telling it. And hopefully there would be some sort of, you know, maybe change and not just any change, just huge shift in the way that we see sexual harassment. Yeah, so that's it, that's all. Uh, thank you so much, Kiki. And uh, before Lydia comes in, and I hope that whoever is mowing in her background <laughs> has stopped, <laughs> um, yeah. I would like to to just highlight. Uh, I think that there's a there's, there's a trend that is that is very evident in what all of you have said up to now, which is how often uh, the media. Uh, Oh, the press often covers uh, sexual harassment uh, yeah. in, a, in largely and interested ways and unsympathetic towards women. And um, also there's this, uh, as media theorists like to remind us, there's uh, uh, that audience always ha exerts some kind of um, power when it comes to what they consume. And often uh, we who are in the media covering these stories are a complete reflection of who our audiences are when it comes to who is asking for accountability and what that looks like. Um, uh, so Lydia, please, you have the virtual floor. Yes, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry about that. Um, I had to make it stop, I couldn't hear you. Um, so, 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 so I think just going from what Kiki was saying, they were human beings, not just journalists. And I think that is really the thing that's missing from a lot of media coverage of sexual, uh, sexual violence, sexual, uh, sexual harassment, is there's so little humanity in it, which, which, is, very, which is very odd because, I mean, journalists are, of course, human beings. There's, there's really, there's n nobody really ever asks you to split your humanity from your, from your journalism. If you're, for instance, an African living in a dictatorial state, you're not considered biased because you do not like dictatorship, right? From your own experience of that in the world, you're allowed to have to, you're in fact expected to highlight the ways in which dictatorship is harmful. So, so, but it's only again, and it, I think it's part of the, the, the sort of systematic bias and the systematic trivialization of women that when you approach a story, when you approach this particular story with your humanity, the same humanity you that with which you would have approached a story about poverty, the same humanity with which you would have approached a story about political violence, you're then considered biased. Right, and then we must defend ourselves. Oh, I'm not biased. Oh, accept yes, I'm biased. It's like you're a journalist, and you're also a human being, right? And that's that's exactly what you're supposed to bring to the job. Um, so, but I think part of why we don't have that humanity is exactly because we've refused to introspect about what's happening within the media space itself, and what's you, you know, and what what the experience the experiences our own reporters go through. So we treat sexual violence victims as if they were other, as if their experiences are so unusual and old and extreme, or oh, then we treat them as this exotic, in a negative way, exotic experience. Yet in fact, we see it every day with people who, like, like Kiki says, have had the exact same experience. And in fact, if perhaps we recognize that within ourselves and, if, and to the extent that it is safe and acceptable to them, to, to, to women, uh, let them uh, do those stories, perhaps they'll bring more humanity to the story because to them, it is not, it is not some exotic out of the wild experience. So, so, I, I, so, so yeah, I think, 
uh, like, like I was saying, one of the most productive conversations I've ever had about Me Too was a friend telling me that when the dust began to settle, he began to ask himself, Me Too? And I think we all could do a lot to ask ourselves that. Because like I said, it's a culture. It's not some anomaly. It's not something some terribly bad guys do. It is, in fact, it has extremes. But it's also a culture, it's very, it's, it's very normalized. And if we all ask ourselves, me too, to what extent do I contribute to this? To what extent do I turn a blind eye? To what extent have, you know, have I had the same experience? And therefore, how can I draw from them to, you know, and how can I take people under my charge? So I think, well, you know, in terms of concrete recommendations for media houses, I think, as we do risk assessments and as we do employee sort of welfare and satisfaction um, assessments at the end of the year or whatever period, we need to ask those questions. How often is sexual harassment an issue for you in the office, in the field, uh, and as also as we measure our own performance to what extent I, I, I like to I like to think I know it doesn't happen enough, but I think every media should take time at least once a year to audit their content and take you know away from the public eye and look at your own content. Uh, to what extent did we cover this issue, which is so widely, uh, which is so widely prevalent? And how did we cover this issue? And if we're going to ask, if we're, go, if, if we're going to ask audiences to, you know, every year media houses will do things like, who was the man of the year? Who was the what of this? We ask audiences to, to, to actually have meaningful feedback on our, uh, on our content, including those things. How well did we do on this? How well, you know, or at least can we curate how people react to these stories online. I have a very complicated relationship with online feedback. Uh, I think it's really, really important, but also in real time, it's really, really stressful for journalists. Uh, but can media houses who are not the actual reporter who did the story take, uh, curate that, that feedback and turn it into, you know, useful institutional knowledge that you can use to improve from, from time to time. So I think it's a lot we can do, and, but I, and I also really believe as, that we're never going to treat sexual violence survivors uh, well enough if we do not recognize the extent to which they are us. They're very much like us. Their experiences are very much like our own or like our colleagues. And we are never going to cover the issue systematically, not as you know, systematically on an everyday basis as a bit, in fact, you know, I, I fantasize about this idea of there being a women and equalities desk in a, in a newsroom. Um, unfortunately, when newsrooms create them, then they do mostly uh, sort of entertainment and lifestyle content on those desks and every, every so often maybe also uh, some, some health reporting on that desk and they do not do the more political more, more, uh, uh, the more political things like sexual violence so so but yeah but I, I, I think it would definitely charity is going to have to start at home and which is a good thing because actually you can do a lot of things and media houses can look and evaluate themselves and audit themselves and do without it turning into a media storm. Um, but if you ignore it, then one day you wake up and your Twitter is blowing up because one of your employees is a rapist, and then you have to make up you make up you have to make up some quick uh, PR type statement that you have no systems at all for seeing through, and then it becomes for you know a thing that people constantly. Uh, call you out for until you even hit uh, public discourse, which is a very sad place to end up if you're a journalist. So I think we can, we can start and get ahead of it. And we can get ahead of it because in general, the societies within which we operate are also 
as book as um, as booklet about it as we are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Lydia. And I think that uh, speaking to what all of you have said, uh, there's this idea, and I think that uh, all of us who've been to journalism school, there's this idea that is like constantly told to us that the good ten tenets of journalism is objectivity and neutrality and often conflicting. And I think that often conflicts with uh, if you're reporting on sexual harassment or even uh, if you describe yourself as a, as a feminist journalist. So because uh, journalism as a profession teaches, teaches us detachment. In, in the way that we tell our stories. And, and I think that often uh, our time, that means that media is oblivious uh, in its own position of power. So, um, and I know each of you have touched on this point one way or the other, but um, starting with uh, Alice, can you guys give, say, um, recommend give recommendation in terms of how in terms of best best practices whether it is from your own experience or uh, or it is institutional in terms of uh, your institutions required require you to do a b c d because I, I think that there are journalists who are on the call and if they are not i am trusting that the participants will share these uh recommendations in terms of just uh, how to transcend good journalism and objectivity and neutrality. Um, Alice, you have the floor. Yes, thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, so um, as Jackie said, I'm going to talk uh, a bit based on my own experiences, um, how I think journalists should uh, approach stories involving sexual violence, um, and how both we as journalists and our media houses um, can tell these stories better. Um, I'll do this in three sections. Um, so the first will be um, what to do when you're researching and reporting a story involving sexual violence. Uh, the second section will be uh, when writing a story involving sexual violence. And the third will be what to do after you've published a story involving sexual violence. Um, first, though, I did just want to reiterate that the points I'm making are, are my views. Um, based on my own ex reporting experiences um, so and um, for that reason they are very much um, up for discussion um, this is particularly because uh, I am a white journalist uh, who has primarily reported in Africa and Asia and that power dynamic can't be ignored um, and actually when I was thinking about this panel I asked a feminist journalist friend of mine in the UK uh, for her thoughts on the topic um, and she referred me to a book called uh, Me Not You, The Trouble with Mainstream Feminism by Alison Phipps. Um, so I haven't read it yet, but it looks amazing. Um, but I did read the summary, um, which basically states how mainstream feminist movements like Me Too have built on and co-opted the work of women of color while refusing to learn from them or center their concerns. Um, and also how the feminism of privileged white women in countries like the UK, like me, um, well, I haven't done this, but this is my demographic, um, have also excluded um, and attacked um, sex workers and transgender people. Um, anyway, I won't talk any more about this book, which I haven't read, um, but I think it makes an important point um, because as journalists, um, and even more so as white journalists or male journalists or middle or upper class journalists, whatever privilege you have, we are in that very privileged position of power, um, particularly when we report on sexual violence um, and other sensitive gender issues. Um, so we must center the voices of the survivors we interview and be prepared to learn from them. Um, and our work as feminist journalists should also be to be inclusive of all women, whether it's disabled women, sex workers, gay women, transgender women, women who can't read or write, you know, our reporting has great potential to bring about positive change, um, but also great potential to cause harm and even cause violence itself in some cases. Um, for example, in the UK, um, transgender people have had their existence debated on a near daily basis across the UK media in recent years, um, largely by white cisgendered women journalists. Uh, like myself. Um, and last year, transgender hate crimes in the UK rose by 81% uh, 
um, which many people have attributed um, to transphobia in the British media. Um, meanwhile, in Uganda, um, I mentioned the story I worked on about Bernard Glaser, the German national who was on trial in Uganda for abusing girls in his care. Um, so before and after his death, the Ugandan media continually questioned the testimonies and integrity of survivors, many of whom are underage. Um, they used photographs without their consent um, and romanticized Glaser, as I said, as this white savior. And as I think the Daily Monitor described him as having Kalangala at heart. Um, and this media attention undoubtedly contributed to the renewed flurry of violent threats that these survivors received following Glaser's death adding new trauma um, to these young women who have already experienced huge amounts of trauma in their lives. Um, but on the other side of it, there's been so much positive change as well through um, reporting on sexual violence. Um, as we've mentioned, Harvey Weinstein got sentenced to 23 years in prison following New York Times reporting and other media. Um, as Kiki might talk more about, we've had lecturers at universities in Ghana and Nigeria being suspended or as a result of the BBC, I, uh, BBC Africa I investigation. And um, then we also have Uganda's own Judith Heard, um, who after telling me her story of having her nudes shared without her consent and then being arrested for it, she went on to bravely open up further about sexual harassment and abuse that she has experienced, both in local and international media, and even launched her own campaign to end rape culture. Um, so on that kind of positive, inspiring note, let me go into a bit more on how to approach stories involving sexual violence. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna go through is when researching and reporting a story involving sexual violence. Um, so first, um, let's go through interviewing survivors and some good practices, I think, um, would first be, you know, before you're even going into the interview, um, would be to prepare yourself and your team, whether you're with a translator or a photographer, mentally, you know, for what might be quite traumatizing interviews. Um, and you need to be prepared for that. And also, uh, you know, you don't want to be too visibly upset in front of the survivor or anything like that, because really this is about their story. And obviously you can express solidarity with them, but you need to um, yeah, be in a place where you're able to, to do the interview. Um, and then maybe afterwards as well, kind of, um, if you are, there is, can be something in um, receiving sort of secondary trauma from hearing these stories. So also after you've done that, you know, speaking to, if you were there with any team members or colleagues or, or friends or anyone just about how you felt about it and um, yeah, doing a kind of debrief as well. Um, then when you're actually speaking to the survivor, um, you know, introducing who are uh, your background and why you're qualified to report on their story. Um, be open with them if you are recording the interview, but let them know, you know, it's just for your notes and the recording would be published anywhere if that's the case. Um, and also let them know where the story will be published if you do know. Um, of course, thank them for taking the time to speak with you um, and let you into their story um, and acknowledge, you know, it's not easy uh, to speak about these things um, and something Kiki said which I really uh, yeah agree with and we've spoken about of this this bias thing and uh, really ultimately I think that if you unless you encounter very strong evidence that the survivor is lying or has reason to be lying as a feminist journalist you need to go into that interview believing the survivor that's really important um, and then while the survivor is giving their testimony um, allow them to do so at their own pace, even if they go off topic and it takes a bit longer. You know, this is a story you're really um, privileged that they're willing to share with you and don't take this lightly. You know, give them time to stop, offer them water, let them cry if they need to, just support them in any way you can. And if you feel able and you have had similar experiences to them, you know, let them know that you're not, they're not alone and share that solidarity. Um, this is also can be a tricky one and one that for me at least has come with practice, which is when the survivor talks, judge when is the right time to interject with a question or clarification and how far you can go with your line of questioning. Um, you know, reading body language, what they've said so far, how are you phrasing your questions, um, that kind of thing. 
Um, then if the, con if the survivor has consented um, to having their name used, um, you need to think about what, like even if they've given the consent, whether it's the right thing to do to use your name, which we've also spoken about, and anonymity. The same with photographs. Um, and if a photograph is not appropriate, um, think about how else you can visualize that story. Can you take a photo hiding their identity? Can you work with an illustrator uh, as I did for the Glaser piece? Um, so if you are a male reporter, I would consider collaborating with a female colleague and having them do the survivor interviews, um, basically because the majority of women and girls um, who are survivors of sexual abuse uh, feel more comfortable speaking to women about their experiences, largely. Um, so it's not only respectful to the survivor, but it will also make your story stronger. Um, and the same goes for translators. So if possible, if you're a male or female journalist, do try to use a female illustrator. Um, and it's, I just want to be clear, it's, it's not that I'm saying that men shouldn't report on sexual violence at all. Um, I'm specifically referring to survivor interviews. Um, although there are definitely reasons why women are better placed to write these stories. Um, I would personally like to see more male journalists interrogating masculinity, uh, interviewing men about sexual violence and gender politics. You know, this isn't women's problem to stop solve alone. Um, and I do think men need to be involved, but it has to be in the right way. Um, and yeah, for this reason, I would love to see more media houses having dedicated gender reporters um, and desks, which is something Lydia, uh, I think, spoke about, although she said that um, oftentimes these are, they're not um, maybe tackling the more political issues. Um, then when you're researching your story and doing expert interviews, this may come before or after the survivor interviews, um, obviously research the wider topic uh, and back it up with reliable data. Um, you know, for example, the Glacier piece, I looked into the number of unregistered children's homes in Uganda and wider issues around white saviorism um, and how this can put children at risk. Um, I also wrote a piece about female DJs in Kampala um, taking up space during nighttime, a time when there were um, murder murders going on in Kampala and in the area of women. Um, just because contextualizing survivor testimonies makes them stronger, you know, it makes it hard to just people to dismiss it as just one story or one two women's story, and this is a systemic problem. Um, also, great if you can do any investigative work or get your hands on any kind of hard evidence. Um, can you work with the police or lawyers to get evidence to back up your story? Can you go undercover as BBC Africa I did in Nigeria and Ghana? You know, I think one of the reasons that that documentary was so, of Kiki's was so impactful is because it looked at a topic that so many women know well, at least I know my Ugandan friends felt familiar with it. Um, and, but what it did was highlighted really why it's such a problem and backed it up with hard evidence, which is hard to dismiss. Uh, you can't, it's right there in front of you. So that, you can't deny the power of that. Um, then um, what something I like to do is to put sexual violence stories into pieces linked to different topics to engage readers who might not otherwise be interested in sexual violence uh, themes. For example, I do this, I've done this quite a bit with popular culture stories. So, you know, the Judith Heard piece I did about um, how her nudes were le leaked um, without her consent and she was arrested for it, got, got people interested in celebrity gossip, reading about sexual violence. Um, the same with the female DJs, you know, people interested in music were, were also reading about what was happening to, to women being murdered um, at nighttime in Kampala and the government's attitude towards that. Um, I did a story about Me Too in the cinema industry in India. And again, that got people interested in Bollywood uh, reading about these topics. Um, harking back to what I said at the beginning, you know, is your story intersectional or can you make it so? Have you considered the voices of transgender women, women of color, sex workers, disabled women, gay women, illiterate women, you know, and if you have, how are you going to present them? Are we bringing our own biases to this reporting and how we can we make sure reporting of these women um, is fair? Um, 
And for obvious reasons, um, also just try to make sure, I would try to make sure that at least 50% of the people we're quoting are women. Um, I try to do this in all my stories I write, and I think it's becoming a bit of an industry standard internationally. Um, it sounds easy, but it's sometimes unfortunately harder than you think, but I think it's an important thing to prioritize. Um, so the second thing I wanted to go through was when you're actually writing a story about sexual violence. Um, so you've done your reporting, your survivor interviews, your research, and you're actually writing. Um, so as I mentioned before, you know, make that assessment about whether it's appropriate to use a survivor's real name, even if the survivor consented to that. Um, you know, don't portray passive victims. Um, they are survivors uh, and active agents in their stories. And one way I've always tried to do this is to tell stories of resistance and where possible lead with these or lead with the voices of survivors. So, uh, you know, even if it's a small form of resistance. So, I mean, for example, I, I did a story about um, market women in Kampala um, and how they handle issues of sexual harassment in their workplace, which is the market. Um, and, you know, it was a positive story in the sense they are resisting in a very organized um, way. But then you can also use that resistance to talk about the issues that they face and also issues around um, maybe, you know, how women in the informal sector are being left out of movements like Me Too. Um, but centering the resistance and the voices of survivors, I think, is a good approach. Um, removing ourselves from storytelling as much as possible. Um, from the storytelling. Um, you know, again, I, this is something I'm wary of as a white journalist. The same would go for male journalists um, or any journalist really who is in a position of power, which is most of us, I would say, um, and just always trying to centre the voices of survivors. Um, also thinking about the terminology we're using. Um, for example, I know defilement is a widely used term in Uganda. Um, but looking up the definition, it actually has quite worrying connotations around making something dirty or making it lose its purity. And obviously that's not the kind of um, association we wanna make with um, child survivors of sexual abuse who may already feel feelings of shame. Um, also, and, and also I think it's something like defilement, it, it, skirts away from what we're actually talking about, which is rape, it's abuse, it's assault, it's harassment of a minor. Um, also on language, just not using over-sexualized language, something that was mentioned in the concept note for this discussion. You know, sexual violence is violence, it's not sex. Um, and using over-sexualized language can give your readers the wrong impression, as well as being traumatic for survivors. Um, also, yes, just not using overly graphic language. I think largely there are ways to get point across without doing this, um, which can also be harmful for survivors and readers. Um, then, and also working with your editors is generally an important and can be a challenging process. Um, but yeah, work with them to make sure or try to ensure this language does creep in. You know, you're the expert of this story. You're the one who's done the research, you've done the interviews. So assert yourself and make clear what should and shouldn't be included in your piece. Um, and you know, maybe if you're not sure of the, how conducive this editor is gonna be to your reporting, maybe go from the starting point of not even submitting the survivor's real names or their images if you're not sure that they should eventually be published. So then you're keeping that with you. Um, and then if your editor, you and your editor aren't seeing eye to eye on that, learn for next time and think about which editors are best to work with on this topic moving forward, if you have that flexibility. Um, and then also working with your editor to enjoy your stories on solid legal ground, um, because if it isn't, it makes it easy for people who want to victim blame and attack survivors to do so. Um, and you also want to protect yourself from yourself from legal action, as we've seen in cases all over the world, perpetrators will often threaten this um, or go ahead with this as they're often in positions of power. Um, then my final bit I wanted to go through was what to do after publishing a story involving sexual violence. Um, so obviously, well, I think obviously send it to the, send the stories to survivors who were interviewed and anyone else who made the story happen. I know some journalists don't uh, bother to do this but I think that it's the least you can do when they've shared such personal information with you 
um, and also depending on the situation, they'll be able to share it as well um, to ensure a piece gets traction. Um, send it to other people who you think might be interested, you know, activists, social influencers, other journalists, policy people, MPs, you know, can we find a way of creating a network of allies at media houses and other sections of society who can share and build on um, this kind of journalism? Um, um, uh, let me catch you there. Thank you so much, Alice. Uh, I'm considering, I'm seeing so many questions coming in through the chat. So, and, and I'll, I'll give uh, Lydia and Kihi some time as well, but I think that the one thing that you mentioned, which I, and, and I think everyone has sort of touched on it, is this idea of um, the audiences as well as media conflating sex and selfhood and how, uh, and, and then attaching self-worth to uh, sexual purity or whatever that is supposed to mean for them. And, um, I think that we can learn a lot from the sex workers movement in terms of uh, in terms of the in, in terms of uh, the ideas they've pushed forth towards when they talk about uh, sex and the practice of it. And also, I think going back to the historical aspect of this idea of of sex and 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 selfhood, which is very much rooted in middle class respectability politics. And that still, you know, that still again comes off, comes on to like how uh, media will cover these stories. At the end of the day, it is tinted with misogynistic practices that are, are at the heart of many media organizations. Uh, so, Lydia and uh, Kiki, in uh, if you have something to add to what Alice has said, uh, Lydia, uh, Kiki, you can go first, and then Lydia, and then from then. I will um, start reading the uh, questions from the participants. Thank you. May I, may I go first, please? I, I have a meeting that's, a, that's going to start in about a minute, so I'll just take a minute to respond. Uh, I, I just want to respond to one thing, which is someone is asking the Q&A. Uh, let me see who that is. Um, Elsa from Swana. I was asking, mm -hmm. but how, how do we mobilize young women and men in the media to lead the advocacy for change? And mm -hmm. I think activist spaces need to call media people in, in a way they're not. We, we, you tend um, to involve journalists only when you actually expect and want mid coverage, uh, but a journalist whose politics is wrong or who politics is mature you know whose gender politics is all is never going to do the kind of coverage that you need so i think long for we need journalists to actually produce uh, stories on these subjects we should be calling them into our spaces we should be having conversations with them we should be making friends with them it's you know like that's i think one of the one of the things we definitely can do. Um, yeah, and I have to run. Uh, oh, okay. if, what? oh, no problem, Lydia. You can always just like pop in since this is a virtual yes. conversation. Yeah. Uh, Kiki, next to you. All right. Um, can you hear me? I can. Yes, I can. Okay. All right. Okay. So, um, so Alice more or less said like the bulk of what I was going to say, but I'm just going to add um, to the list is to be sure that we don't erase women in stories and which is kind of like the status quo. So I started a movement a while ago called Document Women because I found out that, I mean, I, we always knew that not a lot of, there were not a lot of women in leadership. But going back to history, there were actually women, maybe not enough, but there were some women and I wasn't able to name them because they had been erased. So with every story that we, we tell, even with stories of sexual harassment, sometimes it's the support system of other women that made this woman go through you know, sexual harassment. Like the important part of the story is that women occupy 
should not be erased. We should be very um, conscious with documenting women. Um, in Nigeria, I know, um, I think Alice talked about uh, having opinions of uh, about 50% women at least. In Nigeria, we, you hardly even find women in opinion polls, like, because naturally women are, are socialized to sort of take the back seat and they don't feel like their voice matters. So I go out for, for a Vox Pop, for example, I talk to 10 people and, you know, I talk to 10 men, 10 men eagerly answer, I talk to 10 women, they're shy, they run away, they're also afraid because the media here is very ugly towards women. A, a, a girl was angry, a friend of mine, you know, when I told her that I wanted to interview her about sexual harassment, said she said she wasn't talking to um, journalists anymore, but, you know, she would do it because we're friends. The reason was because she told one publication the story of her, her rape story. A couple of years later, she's doing work with non-governmental organizations and they, they start the headline with rape, rape victim, you know, speaks out about, you know, it just became her brand. It, and that's what the media does to women. They, they, they take one word and twist it out of proportion. One of the richest women in Nigeria had a two-page spread newspaper interview. And the headline was, I still cook for my husband or I still kneel for my husband. You know, so it's, it's just ridiculous how we sort of erase every other thing about women that is not related to men. So if it's not in being a mother or in being a wife or in being a victim, the woman doesn't exist anymore. So in what we do, in how we work as journalists, we should be very, very conscious about um, documenting women, not erasing their personhood. I think I'll just stop there. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, think that, I think I have an echo or something like that. I hope not. Uh, there is a question from Seema. And she says, for all journalists, for, for all the panelists, do you have any suggestions for reform of journalism education to help prevent uh, journalists reproducing this violence through their work? And um, uh, Alice, you can go, and um, Kiki, you can go next as we wait for whether Lydia will join or not. But yes, she asks, do you have any suggestions to reform for reform of journalism education to help prevent journalists from reproducing this violence through their work. Hey, um, so I, I, I'll say something briefly, but maybe Kiki will be a better place because I actually didn't go to journalism school. I'm self-taught. Um, so I don't know that much about what is taught now. Um, but yeah, I think specific training on gender sensitive um, reporting, um, listing you know, some of the experiences we've all had today, um, yeah, is very much needed. Um, but on the specifics, I, yeah, I'm not sure I can comment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Kiki, do you have something? Okay, so I didn't go to journalism school as well. <laughs> <laughs> but okay. I attended a couple of, um, you know, sensitization trainings. This was for when we were to report um, elections on better reporting women during elections. And I feel like we can take it across elections and apply it everywhere. And I mean, Alice, you don't give yourself enough credit because you talked about um, having 50% women opinion. I feel like these are things that should be taught in journalism school. Journalism isn't what it used to be anymore. Um, a correspondent did the piece on the new news and this is what the new news is sometimes it's really really fast and it breaks on twitter before cnn carries it um so in, in with that speed there is a lot of the, the 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 information is on overdrive and we tend to forget about the basics of eliminating fake news or whatnot i think that we can start incorporating things like this just uh, uh, filtering the news with the speed that it comes, but not just for fake news, for you know, sensitive news towards gender, towards disability, towards race, um, towards all the societal structures that we currently battle. I think it needs to be incorporated into journalism because it's the reality that we face. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I think I will, Lydia, is that you? No, no, that's not that. <laughs> um, I think I will take off my hat as the moderator and go to the heart as a, a journalist and someone who has recently graduated. Oh yeah, this month. 
So uh, I think that to answer Simmer's question, I think that there's a lot that is being uh, done in, in journalism school, though I don't think that's enough. And I think that uh, journalism schools differ differently. So I'll speak to my experience going to undergrad in, in Uganda and uh, uh, for graduate school in New York. So for example, my Ugandan education focused more on uh, the, the theoretical aspect of things. And the, but like having this idea of uh, uh, detachment, uh, objectivity, and more the traditional way of doing journalism, while my other degree focuses more on um, this idea of digital media. Uh, at the same time, uh, interrogating ideas around um, reporting bits that are biased. So, so for example, climate change, uh, sexual harassment, and what does that look like for uh, journalists? And I had one class that was very interesting was called Writing Trouble, where we're just focusing, it was to teach journalists how to cover movements. And I think that uh, those are very important, even though I think that um, the US media is still very much rigid in terms of uh, the difference between activism and journalism and where what stops and then what continues. And I remember one of my professors specifically saying that if I wanted to practice journalism in the US, the, the label of a feminist journalist would be problematic for many institutions when it comes to hiring. And, and I could get, because again, I think that, that, that the idea of uh, and the blurred line between activism and journalism is, is also very much reflective of uh, the generational divide in terms of uh, how news has evolved given technology right now. Um, yeah, so I think that there is a lot that is happening and I think that, but I also think that the, uh, your ideas that what uh, Alice and Kiki you've talked about, I think that the, they are also very much uh, key in terms of practice. So I think that there is, the, there is this school, the paper, the certificate that we get that then, but also I think that that without the practice doesn't really amount to so much. So I think that um, if there is a professor out there or a researcher who's, who's with us, maybe you can take some of the ideas and, or, or more you can share with us what you're doing different if you're in the audience and you're practicing or you want to or, or you're interested in this idea of, of how to reform a journalism school feel free to jump in and there's another question from Elsie Alexander and they say uh, okay what was the question uh, they say the media role, the, the media role is important in the movement. In Botswana, it is not as effective as it should be. The women's rights movement has tried to advocate for protective, for protective, especially for the girl and the young woman. I agree that we need to focus on the perpetrator as well. What is the best method and approach? I think that um, you, you both spoke to this, but if you have... Uh, something that you would uh, both like to add on, uh, feel free to jump in at any time. I think Alice, we can start with you. Um, so the, um, the best method and approach for focusing on the perpetrator. Um, yeah, well, I, I suppose it comes down to what I was, what we've been saying about, um, yeah, believing women and, and survivors, um, and um, yeah, just not not falling into this um, narrative, which is is in a lot of media, which um, you know really um, interrogates the the survivor and, and questions, um, yeah, their um, their, their testimonies. Um, rather than looking at who that perpetrator is. And also what I mentioned about masculinity and, um, you know, men's role in this, that's not examined enough. It's always like, what can women do to stop this problem? And it's like, yeah, I'd love to see more discussion about what, what men can do. Um, Kiki, you had a whole presentation on this, but is there anything else that you'd like to add? Um, I, I, think, I think that's just more... Um, no, I don't think I have any other things to add. Just language, I, I, and it has to be really conscious. 
and you have to ask yourself where the woman is in the, in the, in the story, in the line of tweets right before you go into it, right before you hit send. Just ask yourself, where is the woman in this story? And if she's not properly represented, probably you might want to rephrase and rethink how you upload. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I'm going through, and I think that um, you can also just scroll through the chat and Q&A and pick uh, questions that you feel uh, you could answer at the same time. But uh, before we jump to that, I'm, I, I'd like to talk about the, oh, okay. So this is, so, and by the way, thanks guys for joining in and I'm using here the word guy as a gender neutral term <laughs> with all its uh, problems that it comes with. So uh, there, there's people coming in from everywhere. Oh, wow, guys, thanks for, thanks for this. Um, the, there's a question on uh, actually there's a question on on uh, the intersection between uh, activism and journalism, and how do you draw the line there? I think that uh, Alice, you can go first. Uh, sure. Um, oh, it's an interesting one, and, and what you were saying is uh, not that me or Kiki would know because we didn't go to journalism <laughs> school, but what you say is um, drummed in about being neutral and impartial. Um, but yeah, for me, um, my journalism has always been a form of activism. Um, you know, before I became a journalist, um, I worked for an anti-corruption organization. You know, it's always been the issues that have driven my work rather than just being a journalist reporting on anything. Um, and I think there are an increasing number um, of us in this position. And um, yeah, I'm really excited to where it goes and excited to collaborate with activists as well. Um, I'm so inspired by what um, feminist activists do. And I think we as the media have a really important role to play in, in collaborating with them on these stories. And, and it's not about being biased as well, I don't think. Um, it's just approaching things through a particular lens and, and ultimately I don't think any of the stories I've, I've published have been biased. They've all been founded on uh, evidence and investigations and, and facts and, and numerous interviews. So as long as you're backing everything up um, and doing good journalistic practice, I think if you're a feminist and an activist as well, that's, yeah, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, Kiki? So... That, I think that's also a, a conversation that I've had in my own space because uh, people look at me as some sort of activist. I don't know, I haven't come around to calling myself that yet, but <laughs> I, do, I do definitely advocate for a lot of things. And the key is to be thorough in your work as a journalist. I mean, there's a certain level of, of confidence that comes with being really thorough. It's like being threatened with a lawsuit and you just sit back and laugh because you know that maybe a hundred lawyers have looked through it and you know you gave it your all. You know, yeah, so unfortunately, at some point, you may not, you, you know, you have to, I mean, like I said earlier, you have to infuse your passion into your work. So if you're passionate about, if you're a feminist, and it needs to show in your work. It definitely needs to show in your work. And it doesn't need to be a bad thing that's, you know, feminism is showing in your work. It doesn't have to be a biased thing. It's, as a matter of fact, it shouldn't be. Because, I mean, what is feminism is, you know, the fight for equality. And, I mean, your story is, is, isn't your story supposed to be equal and balanced, right? And so, for, so you sort of compensate for the places where it's not balanced. So the, it's supposed to be a balanced society where men and women have equal opportunity, but women don't have enough, you know, not the opportunity to say that uh, to say sorry that they are equal to men um so your story should be able to fill in that gap and in filling in that gap you're not being biased or you're not being um whatever other word what you're doing is you're just um filling in a gap with your work again thoroughness comes into play when you're very thorough what you're doing um, you depend on facts because journalism is based on facts. You depend on facts, you do your research, you know, you check and you balance every single step of the way. It, it works, it honestly works. And then in your personal space, you can advocate as much as you want, the way you want to. 
Okay, I'll uh, just read something here from, uh, from Rosie. And she's, uh, I think this is key for us. I think she's writing from our experience as a journalist. And she says, from experience, learn your basic rights as per the perpetrators often to try and intimidate you with legal letters. Also investigate the legal firm. The last intimidation letter that I received was from a non-practicing lawyer. So if the case went to court, they would be in trouble. Also investigate all ego and women groups in, also investigate all ego and women groups in South Africa, I think. We have a body who on paper support women, but when one of their friends was accused of rape by over 10 people, they failed to provide support. I think that this is very key for, for especially uh, practicing journalists, but at the same time, organizations especially that are on paper present as women organizations or feminist organizations. And I think I thought that this was uh, really important for just us to know this. Um, Wow, okay. Hey, Jackie, I have a proposal. Okay. This is Leah. Um, I was thinking that uh, maybe we could give uh, a few people an opportunity to actually make verbal submissions. Um, because oh, yes. Just minutes late, left, yeah. It's just Definitely. Um, there, were, there were two people who asked questions. There were two people who'd asked me questions. Uh, oh, yes. The can Q you and ask? Can I just yeah. answer them quickly? Yeah. Yeah, answer um, that then where you can allow uh, okay. whoever wants to have the verbal questions come in. I'll be, I'll be quick. Um, so one okay. was on the point of a male journalist, like when a man reports to having a partner with a woman, would you say a person not from that area should partner with a local, for example, a British person should partner with a Kenyan to tell a Kenyan story? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I think, so this is something, I think particularly if you are a white journalist or a foreign journalist going into an environment you don't know very well, um, if ever I've done that, I always try to um, partner with a local journalist or a local photographer, illustrator, anyone who, who can give that local context. I think it's really important. Um, as I've been in Uganda for a little bit, reporting in Uganda for a little bit longer now, um, I do it less, but I do, yeah, I do always try to tend to collaborate with Ugandans, for example, the illustration. Um, and, uh, yeah, an example, I went to India last year um, and did a story about um, kind of Islamoph growing Islamophobia in the country and how a type of poetry is resisting it. And I collaborated with a Muslim journalist, Indian journalist on that. Um, and he was so valuable and I couldn't have done it without him. Um, so yeah, no parachute journalism, definitely not. Um, and then another question for me was, um, what do you mean to remove yourself from the story? Um, it's a little bit hard to describe, but I think um, there's many different ways you can report and um, some forms of journalism, you, you bring yourself into the story, giving your own perspective, maybe like I traveled to this place, I spoke to this person, I thought this, you know, you're maybe bringing in a bit more of a narrative of, of how you reported on the story and your reactions and interactions. And, and this can be a good form of uh, journalism for some situations, but yeah, regarding sexual violence, um, particularly, yeah, as I said, if that power dynamic is there, if you're white or you're male or privileged in another way, um, I think you need to remove yourself from, from that narrative and focus on their narrative. Um, I, I can I guys, is there anyone who's uh, coming on? Or be, as, the, as yeah. we wait for them, is there someone? Yeah, there's somebody called Rachel Mwendwa. Okay. Uh, oh, she sent a comment and is she they've raised their hand so they oh, probably okay. want to say something so yeah. answer oh sorry Rachel and then Lindsay okay hello can you hear me yes Yes, um, I'm a law student in Kenya, so I'm from East Africa, East Africa, representing. <laughs> <laughs> and I just wanted to make a comment on the fact that um, our legal system uh, in Kenya, and, I, and it's pretty much similar to that in Uganda, um, I think it trivializes 
women's, I mean, it trivializes women's experiences in terms of sexual harassment and rape. I know, for instance, in Kenya, uh, I remember reading the Sexual Offenses Act and thinking, what? Who actually drafted this? Because it doesn't make sense. And I think it really, um, it, it really promotes um, colonial ideals on, you know, how women should carry themselves and things of that nature. Oh, okay. Um, I guess that's, that was a comment. <laughs> yes. Um, so who's, who else is? Um, Lindsay. Lindsay. Okay, Lindsay. Okay, can I be heard clearly? Yes. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay, let me know if you can't because I can be kiki kiki ki. Um, I wanted to just touch on a very important point that Kiki also raised, which is the issue of objectivity. Um, it's something that I used to struggle with in the beginning when I was writing very actively. And over time, I realized that I needed to adapt objectivity for the sake of my own mental health. Um, I had needed to adapt impartialities, you know. When I wrote the story about the MP who was harassed by Brian Isiko, I had to speak with, with, with Pastor Martin Semper. And I had to look at explaining why it's so important for him to collect money to help the pastor so that he doesn't go to jail because we women are stupid. If I had gone in there and not removed myself emotionally, I would have really, really needed to take some, a lot of alcohol after the interview. So it helped me. To, to, to be impartial. One, one particularly painful story I wrote once was about street harassment, and I went to several police stations, and all of the policemen were insisting that street harassment is warranted to keep women in line. If I didn't force myself to be impartial, I, I, it's hard enough. It's mentally exhausting. I have breakdowns. It, it, it's very, very painful. So for me, that's just my opinion. I've discovered that I need to be impartial if I'm going to survive mentally as I cover some of the stories. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay, for sharing with us. I think next is Lida. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but please feel free to ask your question. Hello, can you get me? Yes. Okay, yes, I don't know if it's a question or I think it's more of a contribution. Okay. Um, somebody spoke about the societal battles that we're trying to fight. So I was mm -hmm. thinking, is it because of the way our society is shaped that makes the media trivialize stories of sexual harassment, especially? For example, like in Zambia, we had, um, <coughs> I once worked with the BBC Media Action in Zambia, and one of our partner stations, we had male colleagues within the media house who were complaining about a certain girl dressing indecently at work. And when a manager was after her, everybody, the station manager for radio station was after her, everybody was thinking she got what she deserved because she was inviting so is it because of the way our society thinks? Like, if a girl dresses in a certain way, then she deserves what's coming to her. That's why the media doesn't report on such stories. And I really don't know how we can help set, change such thinking patterns and how the media can come in and write stories of change because that wasn't just the first instance we had. Yeah. Okay. Uh Oh, Kiki, feel free to respond to that. And I think when you're done, the next person will be Elsie. 
So uh, I don't know, Alice or um, Kiki, if you want to respond uh, to that. And the question I think is uh, how, how can media publish stories and also how can media strive to dismantle these patriarchal structures that uh, have predominant or predominantly have a very misogynistic practice when it comes to uh, sexual harassment, but also this very, the normalized narrative that what you dress equals to what you get? Well, I mean, patriarchy is a structure that is more or less the, the, the fabric of our society. So you would find it everywhere, in the government, in medicine even, and unfortunately in the media. So it, it's, it's a question of taking it down. I know it sounds very far-fetched right now, but it's, it's, a tech, it's a question of attacking patriarchy generally. You know, in every space you find yourself as a journalist and then, you know, as a woman at home, on the street, in the hospital, um, maybe your pain being trivialized by a doctor because you're a woman, you know, things like that. So unfortunately, it's just a reflection of the society that we are in. Fortunately, what we can do is ourselves be a better reflection, you know, of feminism and let it radiate in everything that you do at home, at work, as a journalist. Um, it's the same thing. So you would argue with, you would argue with the colleague that wants to, you know, put the blame on the victim in, in a story that she's reading. It doesn't have to be your own story. I mean, you can be your sister's keeper, your brother's keeper, and point out, um, you know, discrepancies in their story, you know, and suggest better ways to frame it in your own way. And also as a mentor, if you have people that you're mentoring, you need to pass it down because it can't end with you. You need to make sure that you create a space, space for the person that's going to replace you. And it needs to be an unending cycle because patriarchy is a system and you can't attack it as a person. You have to attack it as a system as well. So you can build your own system. Um, Alice, do you have anything to add? If not, um, we can go to Elsie. You had a question, so please joining uh, the conversation. Hello? Yes, hello. You can hear me, you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm making a comment. Okay. Um, and because I've asked uh, some questions before, just to say that, you know, the issue of fa the, the intersection between feminism, activism, and the media is a very important one. In Botswana, we've tried to train uh, a media uh, students, we've tried through gender links, in, in, that is a Southern African network. We also tried to sensitize journalists you know, on the issues of gender, uh, including issues of sexual harassment, abuse, etc. But it is not sustainable. You know, we need to have a much more sustainable conversation on this. And I agree with the panelists, and I think the panelists were great. We had very good conversation, very good points. Information was very well, well stated. But we need to find a way of sustaining this conversation so that we get journalists, especially the, the decision makers in the media uh, associations. It's very male dominated. They don't see it the way we see it. And when the stories come of GBV or, or, or Me Too, it's always the women that take it up, not the, the, the station itself. You understand it's brought not as an issue of concern, but as an issue that women journalists bring up. So I think we have a lot of work to do within the media. And I just wanted to know whether we do have Pan-African media association that we can link with at a regional level, sub-regional level, as well as national level, where this conversation must be done in such a way that it's sustainable. And then we, we see how best we take on some of the suggestions that were made, like documentation, how do you document? Interviews, how do you do it? Journalists, some of the most journalists don't know how to do this. So I think mm -hmm. going forward, and I thank Akina Mama for doing this, going forward, we need to find a way of connecting mm -hmm. and then seeing how best we can move forward after COVID-19. Even in the COVID-19 conversation, gender was a missing link. We had to yeah. really push and advocate in Botswana to make sure that gender, especially when the GBV cases and child abuse cases, cases went up, we had to say to them, you've got to put in place mechanisms and responses from a gender perspective, which they did listen, the decision makers, despite the mm -hmm. fact that the gender minister is female, 
we, we're still struggling right now to get relief and support to make sure there are enough shelters, there's enough social support, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have work to do, colleagues. Yeah. And I, I just want to say, please, can we carry on this conversation? And thank you so much for the panelists for their uh, interventions. Thank you, Jackie. Thank I have you so much. Oh, thank you. okay. Uh, there's a question here from Banner, uh, and they say that my, well, I think they're saying, I'll read the question. Um, well, I'll, I think I'll read the whole thing. My mic doesn't work, but the panel does, but does the panel believe that the way sexuality and sex is viewed in African communities plays a role on how the media reports because media basically gives people what they want. Uh, Alice or Kiki, if one of you wants to uh, respond to that, I think that that's an interesting question. Well, I, I would say definitely because, I mean, we talked about the media just being a reflection of what the society is and the society is ultimately patriarchal. So, I mean, the, the people in the media also belong in the society. They go back to their homes, their patriarchal homes, and <laughs> they exist in a patriarchal office, which, which is definitely true. So it, it's just the consciousness that comes with it. Is if you are really conscious about doing something about if the organization actually, maybe we shouldn't just um, boil, boil down to individuals right now. If the organization is conscious about standing for, you know, the truth, uh, they would train their staff, you know, put up all these sensitization programs and make sure that there is a filter on the way they report and there is a gender lens, there is a race lens uh, to the way that they report. Um, I think there's an interesting question here that uh, uh, Shiba Aine asks, how do you all handle threats from people upset by, the sto by your stories? I remember someone who once called me an abuser on Twitter getting arrested. Uh, do, do media houses protect you from such situations? I think that Alice, uh, we had spoken earlier on this, maybe uh, privately, maybe you could uh, respond to that question. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I um, yeah, just gave Jackie a warning before this, uh, <laughs> before this webinar because I've had a little bit of um, backlash um, following the Bernard Glaser story, um, the German national who um, was accused of abusing girls in his care. Um, he recently died um, and they did a story about it. Um, but I mean, ultimately, um, the threats on me um, have been nothing compared to what the survivors have received. Um, and also, to be honest, I think um, my whiteness also puts me in a bit of a position of power there. I think that um, Ugandan journalists reporting on that story, for example, would be um, much more vulnerable. Um, but yeah, I just ignore, I just ignore the threats or um, yeah, abusive messages and emails. I don't open them, I don't read them. It's not worth it. It's not worth engaging with that stuff. Um, but yeah, it is an interesting question about protect, being protected as well. Like if you do really think you're at risk um, and as a freelancer, that can be a challenging thing because um, I have mindful editors who will be like, you know, if I say I don't want I don't want to put this in the story. I don't want to do this and that. They're like, are you concerned for your safety? And I'll say, if I am, and they're always mindful. But ultimately, if something happened, I don't know, because I'm not their staff. So um, yeah, I don't know about that one. But yeah, mostly I think that unfortunately, local journalists would be more at risk than I would of something actually happening, um, um, which is Kiki, would you jump in there with the, sharing your experience with the documentary? Okay, um, so forgive, my room is getting darker, it's about to rain. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, it, we had, so I worked for an international organization. I definitely, like Ali said, there is a layer of protection that unfortunately they can offer a lot more than the local um, media houses can. And this is a thing that we need to look at. We need to look into it. Um, most of these media houses, you know, are under the thumb of the government. And that can, that's, that's just, that can work for proper reporting. What if you have to report against the government? 
and you wouldn't be able to. So um, this is something that we really need to look into. If it's a question of funding or a question of independence, whatever it is, we need to address it because at the end of the day, I'm a Nigerian and I'm going to have to tell Nigerian stories and I do not need to fear for my life for telling Nigerian stories. For the organization that we worked with, uh, BBC Africa Eye, they were very, very, very conscious. They were very uh, security conscious. We had safety drills, we started planning months ahead, you know, because it is their, is their policy as an organization. But personally, I, you know, I have something that I do personally to make sure that I, I keep myself safe or I feel safe in my own home. Uh, mostly, people don't know where I live. Um, I, I also don't post live updates of places that I am, except it's in the place that I'm sure, you know, that I'm safe and I'll be leaving very soon. Um, and I, I, I don't like my, my source of income, and this would come from a place of privilege because not everyone has this privilege. My source of income isn't tied to the people that I'm writing against. So they can't cut that off because there is also financial security in all of this. People can get their funding cut off. Um, so it's it's just it's just if we keep you know supporting organizations that are advocating for independence for journalists because one day it's going to be our turn. So we need to keep lending our voices, and we're stronger when we speak together in one voice. Yeah, and there's a question here on uh, how do we handle misogynistic women in places of influence. So for example, Ugandan TV or generally women presenters who feed into the rap culture and they also use this platform to victim shame. How do we go about that? Uh, Alice, do you want to go fast on that? I'm just thinking about it. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if I, if I would comment specifically on Ugandan uh, media. Oh, no, feel, feel, feel free to comment because I think yeah. that this, this is uh, global. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think, I think we would, uh, it needs to be approached in the same way um, it does with uh, men, men who are misogynistic, um, although there is definitely something to be said for, um, yeah, creating a kind of allyship and um, solidarity between women in in the media um yeah through i don't know if it's it's member organizations for women journalists um yeah networks like that um and really trying to um yeah and, and engage women in these topics because they will find that they are actually personally affected by them um they might just not have thought about it in that way. Like even with the story I did with Judith Heard, she's not, uh, she's a celebrity, she's not a, a journalist, but I think for her, the whole process of speaking to me about um, so really horrendous like abuse and harassment she's faced throughout her life, I think it made her realize that she is a feminist actually, but she's a feminist by uh, lived experience rather than reading books or anything like that, you know? And I think, uh, if you open these kind of conversations, people, women can realize that we do have this thing in common um, across borders. Mm. And um, yeah, it's just about bringing those networks together, which is maybe easier said than done. Um, so there's a one highlight from Maimuna who says that recently there was a case of sex workers being sexually harassed and, and a media house reported the story referring to them as littering the streets. This media out, out outlet is owned by a woman and has recorded a history of reporting in very sexist ways and wiring. Women leadership is important, but I think it's also important for these women to have feminist values and it's the same thing that continues as, and same thing that continues as when men assume these roles. This happened in Gambia. Um, I think that uh, we're probably, we're probably exhausted uh, people's data. <laughs> so just to wrap this up, um, thank you everyone who has joined us. Thank you Akina Mama for uh, putting this together and thank you uh, Alice, Kiki and Lydia uh, for, for coming on board and having this conversation. And I hope that uh, with the kind of conversation that we've had, whether you are a journalist or whatever place of influence that you come from, you could at least pick some practices and move forward with those. And given the fact that this is a virtual conversation, it lives on.
and it, 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 I, I hope that this, I hope that the conversation was an invitation to not only radically imagine a new way of telling these stories, but at the same time to influence your practice. So whatever part that you coming at or uh, change your mind, whatever form of power, because I think that the number of us who are on this call can afford uh, can afford to one buy, buy data to, and can afford to be on those platforms, which means that we all occupy a position of privilege and have some so, some form of power. So my hope is that there is a ripple effect to this. And um, lastly, I think I don't know if uh, the team from Akina wants to say something before we co we completely conclude this conversation. And for me, thank you, and it was an honor to have to be in this conversation with you guys at the same time to think with you in a profession that we all of us love and of course women being at the heart of this uh akina do you guys want to say anything or can we declare the conversation done <laughs> pauline will be closing okay Okay, looks like she's disappeared. No worries. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I'd, uh, uh, my name is Leah, um, Research Advocacy and Movement Building Manager at Akina Mama Africa. I'd like to thank everybody that made the time um, to come and participate in this conversation. And particularly, I'd like to, uh, to thank the journalists that helped um, to frame this really, really important and I think overdue um, conversation. What I would have liked to see more uh, were journalists in the audience, but the great thing is that we have this recording which we can share on YouTube. There were so many fantastic nuggets of wisdom that I just feel like clipping out and, and sharing with media houses right now about simply how to tell a story with empathy, um, a story that's holistic, a story that's you know, that paints a person as human, um, which has not necessarily been the case uh, with stories of sexual violence that we've seen in the past. So I think the panelists helped to frame the conversation really well. They gave us really fantastic lessons because even those of us in civil society, we are also telling these stories. And sometimes uh, we're the ones who end up perpetuating the abuse that the survivors um, then under, uh, undergo. So at a personal level, I have learned so much and I cannot wait for us to then amplify um, all the learning that we have, that we have picked up today. Um, so thank you. Thank you to everybody that um, joined in from corners of the different corners of the world. Uh, that's one of the fantastic things about Zoom now. We're getting all this fantastic knowledge and different experiences from different parts of the continent. Um, so thank you for making the time. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you guys. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you.